Okay, I got my signal. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, web first of our webinar series at Lab Central Bio uh, Tech and Innovation in the Time of COVID. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be uh, moderating a panel this afternoon of three outstanding industry participants. And um, you see them up here on your uh, on, on our left. Um, uh, and let me introduce every single one of them, Matt, Robert, and John. Matt Metteig is the managing partner of Lock Lord's Boston office here and uh, also chairs or co-chairs their specific uh, COVID-19 task force. Uh, Lock Lord is a sponsor at Lab Central and we very much appreciate the ongoing support. Uh, Lock Lord's partners will be featured in our ongoing series here every now and then, so stay tuned for their insights. We also have Robert Urban joining us, uh, former uh, global head of J&J Innovation uh, and previously uh, head of the Koch Institute and CEO and, and um, executive of uh, a number of private companies. Robert was an important partner when we launched Lab Central and brought uh, J&J in as one of our key sponsors. And he has since, uh, since he retired, continued to be a, a great advisor to us and partner in building the, this innovation ecosystem. So thank you, Robert, for joining us on this panel. And last but not least, John Norris, who is with SVB and is in charge of their uh, PE and venture relationships at, at Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank is also a sponsor at Lab Central. And John uh, is uh, the key owner and it, it issues every year or every quarter, you have to correct me there, um, the uh, industry report that SVB uh, hands out for the biotech industry, very important insights uh, to share with everybody. So I'm, I'm glad we have this. A quick, um, quick rundown of our format. We have about 45 minutes for this panel reserved, of which we hope to have about a half hour lead in conversation between the three panelists. And then we'll have an opportunity to take a Q&A from you, the audience at the end. And you have to submit them and, and our back office team is gonna curate them and forward them. So we'll see, we, we are also, so bear with us, have some patience with us. We're also learning to use this new tool. It's it difficult for us to be, uh, to not be seeing you, the audience. So we hope um, that this will uh, prove to be a successful format. So with that, uh, and, and we'll try to wrap up by uh, quarter past two. So with that, uh, I want to, again, welcome the panelists and set the frame for our discussion today. Um, we are all living through this new reality of uh, a world with home isolation. We're all calling in from, I'm calling in from my dining room. Others are calling in from their more elaborate home offices. Um, so we are all somehow coping with this new reality. Um, of course, we are worried. Uh, employees are worried. Everybody doesn't know, no one knows how this is going to continue. So we are all looking for guidance and for uh, some clarity how we could plan the futures for our enterprises and companies. Um, I think it's helpful to gather as many viewpoints as we can. Today, we have uh, input from uh, people with great experience and overview on the finance and private equity and entrepreneurial side. So I want to ask uh, and kick off my, my discussion with John, asking John about give us an overview of sort of the broader sense um, in which you see this crisis play out for our biotech industry. We, we want to sort of try and start with a broad view of, of how this impacts biotech in general, and then try to break it down more granularly, granularly as we go, how our individual companies may be able to prepare for this. John. Yeah, thanks, Johannes. Appreciate it. And um, 
what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of a perspective of what we see broadly in the market that sort of set the stage for what we're experiencing right now, and then go into some of the things that I've learned from talking with venture folks and just doing some analysis on what's going on in the market. So, you know, if I think about an overall assessment for the venture backed biopharma sector, I would call it, you know, cautiously optimistic. And why is that? Well, historically, if you go back to 2019, there were 50 five zero venture backed biopharma IPOs in 2019. Those set a record for IPO pre money values at 337 million and typically had a 2x step up from the venture round to the MES round. And then there was another step up in valuation from the crossover led MES to the IPO. That's all good news for private investors. Then the IPO class of 2019 saw an unprecedented public market run up. By the end of the year, those deals had an average price increase of 56% from their IPO price. Those are heady numbers for both the venture investors who did the Series A, but also for the crossover investors that did the MES. And just to give you a sense of crossovers, I define the crossover investors as public-minded investors who are opportunistically investing into private deals. And examples of those folks would be folks like Cormorant, RA Capital, Perceptive, Deerfield, Logos. You know, those crossovers lever leverage the open IPO window by investing in the private MES rounds of these biopharma companies, and then double down by then investing into the IPO. They've been a super important part of the biopharma venture ecosystem for the past six years, and have helped to, pro, to pro, excuse me to propel the sector to, to new heights as we see it. You know, from an IPO public M and A and overall return perspective, I characterize 2019 as the best year ever in venture backed biopharma. And so, so now that we've sort of closed the books on Q1 of 2020, which to be fair has been fairly disastrous for the overall financing markets, you know, the class of 29 IPOs are still up 47%, which basically meant that those companies are still treading water through this quarter with venture investors and crossovers still up and doing well. In addition, you saw seven IPOs so far in the first quarter of 2020, you know, before COVID-19 became all encompassing and they went public at a $560 million medium pre-money value, which is a 50% increase over the record of 2019. And they raised a median amount of $180 million in the public markets, which is 2x larger than what they did in 2019. So those IPOs were all before mid-March. So you would think that those companies surely did poorly in the last two weeks of the quarter, but at the end of the quarter, five of the seven were trading higher than their IPO price and the overall IPO price increase was about 17% for those companies. So, though, so thus my perspective is that venture investors and crossovers are still in good shape to generate significant returns on these public companies, if in fact we've hit a bottom, which is obviously not certain at this point, with the opportunity to supplement IPO performance with a rash of really good M&As of recently public biotechs. And a good example of that would be a company called 47, which was backed by venture and crossover investors, went public in 2018, and then were acquired by Gilead for 4.7 billion in March of this year. So in a different scenario where all the stocks were down and the IPO window was closed, it would be easy for crossovers to leave the sector and pull the plug on their private investments. However, the historical good performance we've seen means that the crossovers are still up and not pushed to leave the sector through poor results or rebalancing considerations. They now have to wrestle with the option of either you know, leaving the private market to focus on the publics or continuing to support private MES rounds and hope that the IPOs will continue. And I think what I've seen is that I think they're going to continue to invest in private deals. And just in the last week, there were four MES rounds that were done in biopharma to help push that agenda. So you have Pendion, Legend, Elevate Bio, Sutravax, all of them raising $100 million MES rounds. But, you know, for the venture deals that are not already in the queue, the prospects I think are a little bit more uncertain. I still think deals will be done, but venture investors are struggling with a number of things, you know, three of which are, you know, one, they need to stratify their existing portfolio to assess the cash needs and major value inflection. You know, there will be clinical trial delays as doctors divert to tr their traditional practices, you know, to pitch in for COVID. You know, the stay at home mandate might affect enrollment. Additionally, data collection of ongoing trials may be difficult. You know, many VCs that I'm speaking with are predicting three to six month delays in their portfolio company's clinical development plans. And so investors are looking for portfolio companies to have cash well into 2021. So some significant work and frankly, significant time will be needed to show up balance sheets to the detriment of doing new deals. 
you know, adding to this, we've seen the phenomenon of some of these Series A investors that have been over-investing in Series A to the detriment of their reserves over the last few years. You know, they want to deploy more capital early as these MES rounds and the subsequent IPOs have been happening like clockwork. But if the IPO cycle is impacted, it will make it more difficult to support these companies with their lower capital reserves. And they may need to cut back on new investments in the fund in order to shore up those reserves. So that could equal less money in the market for new deals. So secondly, we just don't know how long you know, this pandemic is gonna last. You know, the big financial questions that the investors are talking is, you know, what's gonna happen in the public markets and will IPOs happen? And so we've seen many investors sort of push the pause button for the next quarter as they assess the market. You know, some investors that are investing are now actually looking at the public markets to deploy new capital because they're looking at the 250 plus new biopharma IPOs over the last few years, and they're looking for value plays. And then on the other side, we're seeing some, some firms that have capital to deploy are looking to invest in early preclinical private companies where they can kind of like ride out, you know, the clinical development issues expected over the next quarter or two while continuing to invest in compelling technology. And then finally, like the third part is, you know, what about valuation? You know, that's, you know, we're not really sure about valuation at this point. I don't think it's going to affect the seed pricing valuations that we see. But if the IPOs drop off, we'll absolutely see a decline in Series A and Series B dollars in valuations. Although I think in the end, you know, there's cautious optimism, as I was saying in the beginning, with the MES rounds I just mentioned and the fact that we're still seeing IPOs go out. You know, five days ago, a company called Zentalis, which is venture-backed, priced at the top of its range and raised $150 million on a $450 million pre. Um, so you combine that with you know, more than $2.5 billion in venture funds raised in just the last week by Arch Flagship and Ben Bio. And so overall, I think the run in biopharma is not yet over, but you know, we have to deal with the current situation we're in. So that's kind of sort of my, my state of the union, Johannes. That, that's a rapid overview, John. Thank you for, uh, I'm sure we could have spent an hour and a half on this. Uh, you packed it all in like 13 minutes. That's very efficient. Um, I, I want to ask Matt, as you are working with venture funds and with um, it, our industry, especially the segment that I interface with, which is early translation from academic into their first um, corporate embodiment that happens at Lab Central and, and at Biolabs, all of these companies need venture capital financing. And we heard from John that um, new deals might be hard to finance right now while, while the VCs are looking to just protect their existing portfolio. How do you see the prospect for the venture market in general uh, currently? Are venture funds able to raise new money? Are the uh, providers of capital for venture funds, the limited partners, uh, willing to invest in our sector right now? Or are they looking at it and rebalancing their exposure to, to the biopharma sector as a whole. Do you, do you have insights that you can share there? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is that uh, for the most part, fundraising activities are on temporary hold. Um, you know, we, I think for the next few months, certainly um, equity financing rounds are gonna drop off uh, pretty dramatically. Um, you know, people can't do the due diligence that they would normally do. There's no kicking of the tires that, that can happen right now, no face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Um, you know, financings that do happen during this time are gonna be more investor favorable terms, um, more dilutive terms. Um, you know, venture, venture and private equity funds, I think they're worried now about their LPs, the ones we've talked to back in 2008, 2009. Um, there were some funds that experienced for the first time um, LPs not being able to honor their, their commitments or being reluctant to honor their commitments. That's a really ugly situation that GPs will absolutely want to avoid. So I think the financing products that are available to venture funds are more sophisticated these days. So um, they will be able to draw down on uh, capital lines if they find a deal that they want to, they absolutely want to do in the near term. But uh, I think generally speaking, we're gonna see uh, things getting a little more quiet. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we are seeing a lot of activity on is uh, funds and our individual companies that we represent really 
looking into the CARES Act uh, loan programs that are available, particularly the Paycheck Protection Program loans, which uh, uh, provide a somewhat unique financing opportunity where uh, people can apply for loans that can be used for ordinary course operating expenses, payroll, utilities, rent, and uh, you know all of the loan can be forgivable if it's used for um, for the 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 use of proceeds that's mandated, which has to be at least seventy five percent of it used for payroll purposes. Um, you know that is something that every company out there should be exploring if they haven't already started. I mean most. And you would recommend, uh, excuse me, uh, but but yeah. I want to highlight that. Would you recommend that even venture capital funded companies apply for these vehicles? Because there had been some uh, fuzziness and, and lack of clarity about whether they'd be eligible. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and uh, you know, at the tail end of last week, they did provide more clarity around that. And particularly the biggest challenge that people have is if you are owned by uh, you know, more than 50% of your voting stock is owned by a venture capital fund, you may not be able to qualify it because of the affiliation rules of the SBA. But we've been working with clients even with greater than 50% to try to restructure their equity interests as partially, some of them non-voting, some of them voting. Uh, there are protective provisions that you can have in your organizational documents, your stockholders agreement or your LLC agreement that will um, give you some controls over fundamental types of decisions, but not run afoul of the SBA affiliation rules. So for ev pretty much for everybody, you should be considering it, even if you have uh, you know, an owner that's greater than 50%, because they may be willing to reduce their voting control in order to be able to access these funds. Um, you know, This is really the only program out there right now that allows you to just basically put everything on pause, use this these funds to, to, to pay for your operating expenses over the next few months uh, and not have to pay them back. Very good, thank you. And I, I believe we will announce the seminar that, that your firm is offering on Thursday where uh, people might be able to hear even more detail on this, uh, on how to practically uh, position their companies to to have an opportunity there. Robin, I want to ask your position and your viewpoint from having run a very large innovation franchise within j, &J <clears throat> responsible for partnerships of all sizes, acquisitions, and, and strategy. What do you see, like, if, if it's hard to raise venture financing for our companies now, like we've heard, um, what do you see the appetite of the large farmers to be? And is that an avenue that our entrepreneurs should be pursuing? That's one question sort of, is there interest on the large farmer side currently to do partnerships that might provide maybe some non-dilutive financing for our companies, but also in the larger picture, investment interest will come back into the sector if investors are confident that the companies can be bought or if, if, if as john says maybe the ipo window is not open for now but at least if uh, an alternative could be that companies can be acquired uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience there and your assessment of the current situation yes we're glad to and I'm delighted to be here and hope we're reaching everyone in a safe and sound setting for themselves um, i don't think anything that's happened thus far really will change the fundamentals that were started probably you know, a decade and a half ago of large companies, essentially all of them becoming honest about their interdependence for innovation and the innovation ecosystem that they have, I think all across the board come to realize that there's just no way that they can be productive enough. You might call it lucky enough uh, to arrive at through purely internal R&D based approaches, the stream of, of access to breakthrough technologies and product concepts that you know, they depend on to build the ever uh, growing um, product lines that uh, the world uh, expects of them. And so there's nothing about what this has translated to thus far that will change the, the need for large companies to look to small companies to help them grow, right? So that's certainly going to remain uh, ever so true. The, the fundamentals of you know, getting a deal done are, are uh, certainly gonna be tripped up by this. People 
are uh, very anxious always about how thorough a due diligence process has taken place. You know, what would they need to know that would really require them getting to know people, you know, uh, closely, uh, review data rooms and manufacturing capabilities and all the various things, you know, in very thorough ways. This will, I think, even in some ways, uh, may even uh, underscore the importance of rigor and quality, you know, and getting, you know, the right types of deals done. Uh, and it'll be more complicated, you know, while we wait our way through this, you know, to get people to be able to do the work that needs to get done. Um, but there's going to be, a, I think, a remarkable moment in history that's also being made visible by this, this pandemic. And that is that science and healthcare innovation is going to rise to save us all, right? And everyone in this instance is going to be watching. The world will be paying attention to how science matters and how medical innovation can you know, make the world a better place. And hopefully that has lasting uh, repercussions for how we think about healthcare, how we think about investing in, in, in uh, education, how we think about so many things that in some ways we almost have wandered away from in a, in a, in a way. And so I think there can be a, a remarkable uh, reinforcement through what is inevitably going to happen here is that you know, we're gonna find a way to treat this virus. We're gonna find a way to create vaccines that protect us and our children and, and hopefully our elderly and you know the world will will move on to be a better and safer place. We're certainly on our back legs at the moment, you know, but that that will um, be something I think we can all count on, and it will reassure the markets. It will reassure reassure the world. I think of, of how important all this this is. But you know, we have some tough days ahead, you know, and maybe tough months ahead. And so anyone who's running uh, any type of business, frankly, you know, a life science business, perhaps even some ways more difficult than others because they require so much money and uh, high risk capital to be involved, needs to be taking some very careful, I think, uh, care of the decisions that they make. And, you know, love to dive into that as we, we talked about some of the practical aspects of how to get from here to where we're going, you know, and get out the other side of it effectively. Robert, if you were running a company now, uh, and you know the phenotype of our companies, uh, what would you and your management team try to do to survive from now through September or maybe through Q1 when uh, you might have app, uh, ability to, to access capital again? Yeah, I'm not sure you know, what we would use as the most appropriate analogs, moments in history that teach us something about kind of what you know, we're up against. Uh, I remember in, in my personal career, uh, uh, a company that I had helped co-found was out on the road trying to do a mezzanine round to hopefully be one of the few companies that went public in what was essentially one of our the beginnings of our, our last great recession and right after 2000, 2001, was sitting at a breakfast table with our investment bankers when the first plane hit the, one of the towers in New York and the markets utterly shut, right? There was not going to be you know any transactions done for a foreseeable period of time. We were in the process of scaling up manufacturing for big phase three clinical trials and all these things that for which we had not near enough money. Uh, and we wound finding one of those opportunistic buyers, you know, that took our, our company, um, made it, I think, a fantastic transaction for all those uh, there. But, you know, it, it was important for us to make swiftly some, some new reality set decisions, right? We had to, I think, my CEO at that time focused on what he called the C5, right? We had to be really, really good effectively communicating. What do we know exactly? How is this going, right? Being really, really crisp in updated communication with all of our stakeholders. We really had to move quickly to conserve the resources that we had so that we didn't wind up, you know, making poor choices that didn't pay off. We had to consolidate, you know, all of our infrastructure around the things that mattered the most. Uh, and we had to learn how to compromise more so than we ever had in the past to really swiftly take advantage of, of the speed that we could represent as a small company by making decisions as fast as we could possibly make them. And I think most importantly, he taught us all, you know, every day about the importance of caring about what we do, right? You have to deeply remind yourself in moments like this why you're doing it at all, you know, because it requires that compassion. It requires that commitment to the patients and the people that work for you that get this job done and really realizing that without you're really reflecting on how they're holding up and why you do it. A lot of time is, and money is wasted. So those things were what we focused on, you know, and I would encourage people to reflect on those as they get ready, you know, for this journey, because we've got a ways to go. Thank you. I, I hope uh, that your uh, optimism is warranted that we'll learn from this and we won't just go back to our old ways. I think um, one of the topics that we had all struggled with uh, before this crisis hit is how we pay for drugs and how 
um, in this country, many drugs have become unaffordable for the patients who need access to them. And so I, I want to put a hopeful note out there that this may help some policy makers uh, see the importance of having coverage and healthcare uh, for all Americans. Um, but I don't want to delve into politics here. I, I want to ask John, um, how do you see us come out of this? How do you expect, uh, what would be signs that the economy is opening back up? What do we need to look for um, after we've taken all these measures that, that Robert has described uh, for our companies? When will we know that we can go back out and hire people again and that we have some confidence that uh, there's some coming back to normal? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a it's a hard question to answer right now, um, where where we are at this current situation. But yeah, I would say you know one. I think you know monitoring the amount of capital that these investors are sort of putting into place. I think we're really not going to see the ramifications of the deal flow until we really get to you know late into April, where we start to see these deals actually coming to close and see what. You know, valuations are impacted if, if at all. And you know, to, to see a company to go IPO just last week in the face of just a very difficult financial environment. And we also saw a number of other companies that filed to go public, you know, I think sort of feels as if if there is a bright spot, you know, in the financial markets, it is in you know healthcare and it's in biopharma. Um, so I take that as a as a positive. And then just to sort of Robert's point. I think you know there's there's a lot of acquirers out in the market, and I think that's one of the distinguishing characteristics of biopharma versus some of the other healthcare sectors is that you have a lot of folks who want to add to their portfolio. And really, what we've seen, <clears throat> the public market has been just been so good that most of the private venture backed companies have been the ones that have jumped into the public market instead of potentially accepting an earlier uh, M and A, which you know has a has a, you know, it has a top to it in terms of what your upfront is, and they'd rather take their chances in the public market. But we've actually seen, you know, a lot of those companies that went public and, and 47 was example this year, but you have, you know, Dentists and Synthorix and Roth Pharma and even Spark last year, um, all got acquired as public companies. And so I think if there is not a public market, you're going to see a lot of the private companies actually have some substantial conversations with acquirers and look to get acquired during that time. But you know, it, to get back to your question is when do things open up? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how much the slowdown is really going to shut down the biopharma market for venture back deals, because you know, as we mentioned with those funds just closing last week, the the fact that the market has been so good for so long have allowed investors to do well and provide returns back to their LPs so that most of the firms that are company starting firms have fresh capital and have fresh capital over the last six months to one year. And their typical investment cycle is what, one and a half or two, two to two and a half years investing into new companies. So the, you do have that capital out there. And in the end, when you think about it, you know, that is their sole thesis is to invest in innovative companies that may change one way or the other based on early stage versus later stage versus the, the, the current economic cycle that's out there, but they do have to deploy that capital. And that's what the LPs want them to do. So while you might have a very small pause right now as they reassess, you know, in my mind, you know, you know, that's, that's maybe a quarter, uh, maybe it's a little bit longer. Uh, as they just write their ship and they understand what's going on with their existing portfolio. But I don't think that that's a long-term issue. And I do think that, you know, while the numbers in 2020 are just not going to be the same in terms of the amount of financing in the private market, as you saw in 2019 and 2018, um, it's still going to be substantial. Thank you. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left and I already see good questions coming in here from the audience. So I, I will try to read my ticker on the side at the same time, uh, trying to process some information. Um, I think this is a good uh, question for Matt as you're interfacing with BC funds and, and private equity players. Is there, is there planning happening in the industry uh, to get ready for a phase? Or is the industry even expecting a phase of inflation with all of this new money being pushed into the system? 
Uh, is the industry preparing for that? Uh, what, how do we think about that? Is it, is it good or bad? How can we position ourselves not to suffer from that? Well, I think it might be a little too early to tell um, with the program just becoming available last Friday. Um, I do think the the thing that um, Robert was alluding, was mentioning about uh, one of his companies back on 9-11 is, you know, certainly companies in this time have to take necessary steps to be able to weather the crisis, make difficult choices to conserve cash and become more efficient. Um, I think those things will bode well for those companies that that make it through this um, would would do well for for any company. But um, I don't know that the um, the infusion of additional cash is really uh, you know it, it's not it doesn't change the game because these companies would otherwise you know have funding uh, from another source. Uh, you know I guess this is just a stopgap measure and it is only uh, good for about two and a half months worth of expenses. So we'll have to see whether there are additional programs like it uh, that follow. Johannes, you're on mute. I was hoping to use my newly learned skills of holding the space bar and <laughs> unmuting myself. It didn't work, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Matt, do you, do you think that the specific medical problem that we see with COVID uh, will uh, change the portfolio of the VCs that you're working with? Are, are <clears throat> the fund identify infectious disease as an area uh, where they might want to deploy investment? That uh, we, we had a situation in the past and we had commented on this through our blog before that investment in antibiotics and in anti-infectives was woefully uh, lacking in this country because of the way that our um, incentive system really is built. See that there is an openness, uh, a change happening, and that's a question I, I want to ask the other panelists as well, but maybe starting with Matt. Sure. Yeah, I, I do think that there'll be renewed interest in that. There, there are areas that obviously have been neglected for funding for some time that uh, are obviously magnified now because of the problems that we're facing. Um, I do think, uh, like uh, Robert and Jonathan, uh, that uh, this will encourage more investing in the healthcare sector and biopharma sectors. I think um, you know that'll certainly bode well for for the indus industry as a whole, but in particular for um, infectious diseases. I know Robert will have opinions on infectious disease. I read in your bio that you're actually a microbiologist, so. You're the only one on the panel that really know, knows what we're talking about. I'm not sure I could defend that at this moment, but uh, anyway, uh, some time ago. But I, I only hope, you know, that this is the kind of moment, you know, that uh, a crisis, hopefully not unutilized, to remind us, you know, the importance of some of these things that seem to, to have, uh, outside of a crisis, you know, de minimis value, like antibiotics and other preventative things that you know the world needs to be paying much closer attention to, particularly for the vulnerable. The ones who are really most at risk here are the ones that I think we have to find new ways to, to wrap our, our system around. Um, my hope is yes, you know, there were some you know, very, um, I'll say incremental things that were done as we you know, had our, our last turn through the crank of a financial crisis and some things that were you know, thought to be accomplishable then on healthcare in general, as we thought about how we might reorganize that. Uh, let's hope that this is bad enough that we can do it much better this time. John, do you have a view? I, one of the audience questions is specifically to this, uh, um, that many investments in the past have focused on chronic and, and not on short-term illnesses. Uh, so cancer over antibiotics. Um, do, you, do you see, or what, what is your view of how our system could be structurally adjusted to allow investor return uh, that, that would support the development of treatments like the ones that we need now, right? Like antivirals, antibiotics um, that we haven't really invested in in the past. Yeah, a, a great question. And you know, when you look at the financing data from the venture side, you know, anti, um, yeah, and antibiotics, anti-infectives have really been down over the last couple of years. And that really was because 
on the exit side, you found it very challenging. A number of companies went public and found that it was a difficult difficulty in one, they, they weren't getting acquired before they had to commercialize. And then the commercialization side of it was just very hard. Um, and so the value back to investors have not has not been what it has been in, in previous uh, cycles, uh, where you did see a lot of those companies get picked up in the private market. So I'm really hopeful, just to your point and to everyone else's that, you know, something like this really does um, thrust you know, anti-infectives in that whole sector into the limelight. And, you know, it's not just that, but it's also, you know, the, the tools and diagnostic sectors too, um, which will, you, you would think you would see, you know, a, an increase in, in interest in that area. Um, but yeah, anti-infectives has been a, an area that's been pushed down recently. And I remember I saw a tweet by um, Scott Gottlieb, I think it was last year that said, you know, that was definitely an underappreciated area. And I think that's going to get a lot more appreciation going forward. Matt, here's a question for the, uh, from sort of the practical side of things, because many of our companies, while they're not revenue driven, they're, they're venture funded. Uh, but in a way, they're also making it from one stage to the next. And if they do not meet certain milestones their investors oftentimes may not may may decide to not fund the next tranche of financing uh, how do you see the companies that you're advising respond to that or the boards that that are making these decisions um, will will entrepreneurs be able to plead leniency or, or forgiveness here with their boards have you seen examples that you could point to and maybe are there some strategies that uh, young CEOs or, or founders or entrepreneurs could employ to, to get their boards aligned, how they can get through this crisis? I think it's a great question and I don't know that I have uh, the, the, the answer for it. My sense is that I would expect uh, some leniency given what uh, the magnitude of this crisis, I think um, we're seeing in the market, uh, you know, there's, you know, Lenders are giving payment holidays on debt. We're seeing landlords that are giving uh, deferrals of, of uh, rent. Um, you know, we're we're seeing a lot of areas in in uh, in industry where um, they are deferring or or you know holding back uh, payment obligations, resetting timing, and uh, I would expect that there will be some of it uh, here as well. I think it'll be very uh, facts and circumstances driven. Johannes, maybe just a, a you know from from my perspective, I think you know when I look at the data around the financing in the private market, there's a couple of things that make me feel a little bit more comfortable in this particular time with with you know the the issues that we're all dealing with right now is one that most of these syndications or most of the deals that are being done on the early stage have two to three venture firms as a part of the syndicate, and I think that's one of the bigger deals for us when you think about you know, the dry powder that's around the table so that when you are potentially going to be short in terms of development challenges, it doesn't allow you to hit the value inflection point for the next round. You do have inside support around the table to hopefully do a bridge loan or something to get those companies to the valuation inflection point and not have to try and go out and find a new investor in a super challenging financing environment. So I think if there's one piece of advice is, you know, creating syndicates that from investors that have had a history of investing into this sector and traditional venture firms have their sole thesis as investing into this sector. To have those folks around the table is an important part of it. And it's a nice mix between those folks and the, the crossover investors. If you have just crossover investors into a round, you know, the, there's a little bit more of a question mark because those folks tend to be a little bit more opportunistic as to how they're investing whereas the traditional venture folks are there for the long term. So, you know, that sort of makes me feel more comfortable about this situation. There are going to be times where, you know, these companies are just not going to be able to go forward because, you know, the development plan is so delayed and maybe there's not enough money around the table to support. But I think the fact that these have bigger syndicates give, the, give those companies a lot better chance. Yeah. Uh, we only have about three minutes left here and I want to end on a positive note. Uh, trying to solicit from all of you, uh, maybe starting with Robert, 
what do you think are going to be some of the positives that may come out of this crisis? And if we don't have them yet, maybe it's wishful projection and wishful thinking. So I uh, want to ask all of you of, of what, you, what you hope to see come out of this. Well, I would say even at the level of individuals and maybe it'll even transcend to governments, you know, let no crisis go unutilized, right? This is a moment to rethink, reimagine, reappreciate everything, right? And so as long as we're, I think, reminding ourselves who we care about, why we care about what we do and our, our transparency and how we're trying to make a difference in the world, we'll get, I think, further along in this than we otherwise might imagine. So stay positive, but prepare for the hard time. Very good. Matt, what are the learnings that you take for yourself, or uh, is there any source of optimism that drives you through this crisis? Uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, has already been mentioned briefly by you, Johannes, is, um, you know, this will, I, I believe, create a renewed emphasis on the importance of uh, research and science and healthcare, uh, what it means to, to for, for people to have uh, healthcare, um, the importance of contingency planning, and, um, you know, just the importance of data and, and, and facts. So uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, we, this is a, a crisis that's affecting everyone equally. And I, and I'm hopeful that it'll, it'll bridge some divides that have existed, uh, you know, certainly in, in uh, uh, recent history. Yeah, and, and, and for me, I'll just pick up on, on what Matt said. And, you know, there's, you know, the drive on innovation within uh, tools and then diagnostics and manufacturing and scale up and just the push to do this in such a rapid way to, to deal with what we're dealing with right now with, with COVID, I think is, is really, maybe it shows what we're capable of when, when we really get pushed. And I'm hoping that maybe that can help accelerate how, how we do things within our, our venture-backed uh, companies and within the healthcare industry as a whole. So um, I'll, I'll leave that as a positive sentiment. I, I like that, that collective op optimism and, um, and, and the comfort that science and, and facts are gonna get us out of this. I think that's, that's one that we as scientists certainly or otherwise contributors to the science world have to uh, cherish and uphold and we, we should try our best to keep the conversation calm and fact-based. I, I, I am hopeful that the many activities that we see uh, from young companies, from big companies uh, will lead us out of this uh, crisis very quickly. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, panelists uh, for joining us this afternoon. I had uh, a great fun preparing this and then conducting this um, panel with you. I also want to thank the audience for taking 45 minutes to sit with us. Hopefully you learned something. I want to um, uh, focus your attention on our upcoming seminars. And I don't know how it's going to show on your screen, but we have uh, several more events queued up for you. The first one this Thursday, uh, which is going to uh, be uh, hosted by Lock Lord and focus specifically as Matt mentioned on uh, how to uh, access the uh, uh, COVID relief programs that have been made available from the government. And the time is not here. I believe it's 1.30, but you'd have to uh, look at the Lab Central website to get the actual uh, time. And then we have two more of these Tuesday afternoons on uh, April the 14th and on April uh, 21st, uh, trying to assemble similar high uh, quality panels and, and guide you uh, and give you some uh, advice on how to best navigate this. Thanks again to all, and I hope to see you soon. Stay safe and stay home. Bye-bye.